Hi everybody, my name is Leeton, and in this Roblox tutorial, we're going to be looking at touch detection, which is useful to trigger or even make traps in your game. So again, this is for complete beginners. Um, let me show you how it's done right from the beginning here, guys. So I have a, bland, a brand new empty project, and what I'm going to do is create a small little hallway and have a big cube or something at the top and then as we enter the hallway and detect some sort of touch we'll have that cube fall down like a little um, trap or something so here we go we're going to go into parts and just create a cube cube will pop up here and then we can use the tools here to move it and scale it I'll go ahead and scale it first just zoop, make a long hallway kind of like thing and then upwards and then also just make a little bit skinnier now here it is right here part that's what it's called I can rename that and I'll just call it wall instead. So this is the wall that will make our hallway, call it wall. And then I can also just duplicate it. Now there's two walls. I can go to the move tool and then just move one over like so. So I have a hallway. I'll put one here and one there like so. Now I'm gonna make a giant cube that will float above it. And as soon as I enter this pathway, it will then just fall down, basically like a trap. You shall not pass kind of situation. So I was looking in that direction when I created my part. And so what happened there? It creates it all the way over there. So if I'm looking this way, and I go here again to part and hit cube, it creates it here. So do remember that it will create in whichever direction you're facing. That one over there is pretty far out. I'm actually just gonna click on it and hit delete and we'll choose this one here. Let's make our big giant um, trap, <laughs> basically. So I'll just go ahead and I'm gonna square this out a little bit. So this way, droop, and then up, square is looking, and then I can hold shift and evenly um, make it bigger in all sides. If you wanna just make one side bigger, um, you can hold control and then both sides expand, basically. So it's kind of like one angle getting bigger, but both sides. Normally just one side expand if you don't hold any key modifiers. Let's move that into place over here. Oh, almost the right size. Oops, I didn't mean to move that. Just this one like so. That's pretty good. Let's also move it up a little bit. There we go. So I'll move it towards the back of the hallway and then I'll move it up so that the player don't really see it yet and it will fall down now if i hit play we're going to see that there are some things that are not set up for us and we're going to discuss them because this is a beginner tutorial so right away we can see that it falls down and we kind of want it to stay up there so let's discuss that i'll hit stop and i'll hit click on the cube we'll go to home and we're going to choose to anchor it this will keep it up there so it doesn't fall down let's take a look See, it doesn't fall down, it stays up there. Another way to do this is to understand that when you click on something, you see the full description of those things right here, the full details. And in the part section right here, part, the first option is anchor, which is basically what we did. So by unchecking that is the same as on clicking that. See, it's no longer highlight. And if I check this, boop, let's go back here. You see it's now highlighted, okay? So that's the same thing. Let's go ahead and duplicate this to make our trigger. First of all, though, I like to make the names more relevant. So instead of part, I might go with something like float in box. <laughs> Let me not leave any space. It's just easier that way. When you're coding the names of these, try to maybe use underscores, but I rather say I recommend no space. I'm going to duplicate this, my float in box, and I'll rename the other one to trigger box. There you go. Now with the trigger box, I am going to move the trigger box like so. You see that I did duplicate it. There is two. Now I'll bring this one down and I'll bring it towards the front like so. All right. Now let's understand something. We want to walk into this area and then trigger something to happen. If I do hit play though, we do have a problem. There's a giant box in front of us. How are we going to make this work? <laughs> All right, so the first thing we need to do is to then make the box, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uncollidable. That's, that's not the word, but we're gonna use it for right now. Uncollidable. 
If you scroll down in the properties for the box that we're going to use as a trigger, you can see that there's one says can collide, which means you can touch, you can impact, collision. If you uncheck that, that means that you cannot, which means now we can walk right through it. Let's give it a go. Let's give it a go. Let's have a go. Uh, I don't know what I'm saying. Walk right through it. You can see, walk right through it. So if that was a cool future you're looking for, then I'm glad I can help. But that's not what we're here for. Let's go ahead and do more. I'll hit stop and we don't want to see it. It looks awkward being there. You're out of place, sir. This is not your party. What you want to do now is go up to the transparent uh, appearance area and find the transparency. Pretty sure I'm saying that right. Now, in a lot of programs I've done, I've dealt with transparency. Usually when it's at zero, things are invisible. When Roblox, you actually want to turn it up to make it down. Hmm. Hey, that's how it works. I didn't make it. We, we're just going to roll with it. So you want to set it to one instead of zero. And now your box is transparent. Let's hit play one more time. I'm hitting play a lot. You better get used to it. I'm going to walk right through it like it's not there. And the player will never know it's not there because they didn't develop the game. You did. So basically now we have a invisible trigger. So we can make something happens once we walk through this box. Trigger that to then fall. How easy would it be to trigger that to fall? We don't have to do a lot of code to make it fall because as you know, we simply have to uncheck the anchor right yes right so what we want to do is then on our trigger box let's go ahead and dive into our code you want to click the plus button and go to scripts the script will pop up with a hello world command in there that's just the default and also the name of it will be call script if you want to customize this it's up to you i recommend it's a lot easier to know what what script is what when you have a lot so get used to renaming your scripts let's go ahead and rename the script and i'll call this box trigger all right so on our invisible box we have a box trigger script which is a child object okay inside there we find the script it's a child cool so how do we now make it so that when you touch this the other one fall for that we need variables we need to tell the script basically a variable which is a name that represents something in your game or a name that represents an object or even a name that represents a person is technically a variable like x equals three and your teacher then ask you what is three plus x and that will give you six because x represented three not sure why i'm doing math but let's go ahead and take a peek if you're new to variables this is how you make them you have to say local. You don't really have to, have to, but just believe me. Local, and then now your variable name. This variable is going to be a reference to the invisible box first. Then I'm gonna make a reference to the floating box, okay? Let's make a reference to the invisible box first. I'm gonna call this um, invisible box my trigger box. That's the name I'm going to call it in my code even though that's the exact name off the box. That's just normal practice, but the name here can be whatever you want. You can call it Chewbacca if you wanted to. So now the equal sign, very powerful thing here. This is what you, this is when you play God and you say, you are this. So now you, you give it the value that it's supposed to represent. The value of this will be the parent object off my script. Remember my script is a child object. So the parent object will be what this equals to. So we simply say script dot parent. Done. Now trigger box literally represents this trigger box. So I can do anything I want with this trigger box and it will happen to the actual trigger box in my game. Hopefully that made sense to you. If it didn't, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Let's make another reference now, another variable that will represent the floating box, okay? The floating box is also a child, but a child of what? We're all a child of something. We're a child of the workspace, see? Everything that we were just in is inside of the workspace. So we're going to say, hey, um, our variable will equal the floating box that's inside of the works place. <laughs> Can't say that word for some reason. All right, so again, we say local, and then we'll give it a name. I just 
go ahead with the float in box. I think that was pretty good. Equal, and then we can say workspace dot what? What is it that workspace is equal to? Was the call float in box, right? So the dot here is the same as what we did here, just script, and then the dot tells us what is inside of scripts. We said the parent of the script. Workspace, what's inside of workspace. We chose anything we want here. So in this case, we chose the uh, floating box. Could you have done this for the trigger box? Yes, yes, you could. You could have done this. You could have done this like so. And say, instead of floating box, we simply say trigger box. This both works. But since the script is on the trigger box, I find it easier just to do that. All right. Now we have our two variables that represents the two things in our scene. If this is the floating box, then all I have to do is when the game start or when I trigger, when I step into the area, I can say floating box dot and that gives me access to every element that's on that floating box. So if I want to uncheck this anchored, then I should be able to say anchored, right? And then equal it's already checked, so I would just say false. Will this work? Aha, let us find out. So basically, if I play the game now, my code should be the one to make that fall. And it does, except we don't want it to fall just yet. We want to trigger it to fall. So we know the code we need is this. So I'm just going to copy this or cut, and I'll paste it later when we need it, all right? Let's go forward. Let's make ourselves a function that's going to do what I just did. To create a function, we say local. Everything is local, apparently. And then we say function, and then the function name. <laughs> I'm just going to say, just do it, like so. <laughs> that is the function name. The function requires an open and close parentheses, and then after that, um, you need to put the word end at the bottom. And then everything that's inside here is what's going to happen when you call upon this function. So now if I put my code there that I copied earlier, I am good to go. Now if I run my game, it will not fall because the function is created but not called. Hopefully that makes sense to you. You make a function, it's kind of like grouping your code. And in, you can reuse that code over and over and over simply by calling the function. Um, typically, a function is good for when you're putting a lot of codes in there. So you have a full group of code and just call it over and over so you don't have to recode that same thing. Just call this function by the name. Just do it. So once I call this function, let's say right here, you just got to call the function just like that. The function will actually fire off and you'll see the cube now falls. Boom. So now I have a function that I'm going to call, but only when we've touched the trigger box, okay? Which is the invisible one. So now to detect that we've touched the trigger box, it's actually quite simple. We have a reference to our trigger box called trigger box, right? So we say trigger box dot, oops, I don't think it's dot. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is dot, dot touched, right? And then you can tell it what to do when we touch. Do you use the double colon like so? That's not a colon, is it? Double double colon ah because i know semicolon is the other yeah we're gonna we're gonna say double colon and basically uh, allows you now to connect a response to the touch so by using the double colon we can say then connect and what do we want to connect our function so we simply put our do it just do it in here like <laughs> not like that <laughs> let's undo that real quick and paste it right there ah, okay i've done it better now so remember, there's an open. I just want to make some space so you can see it. There's open and close parentheses that goes with the connect, okay, capital C, connect, and then your function name, including the open and close parentheses that belongs to your function. So you're going to see a lot of open and close parentheses, but don't get confused with them. I just create some space there so you can visually see it uh, a little bit better. Um, I, I'm, I think I'm mistaken. I don't think we need the open and close parentheses for the function, like when we called it. I do think it will work without. 
So we'll try it without. Let's go ahead and let's go hit play and see if this works. Hmm. Ah, there it is. Now, if you're getting a problem like me here that you might get, um, let's see here. Hmm. Let's see, something like like so. Let's if I put this about right there, right, and then um, I hit play. Let's see. See, it kind of like fires off by itself, and I'll tell you why that's happening. If that's happening for you, it's because we simply told it that as soon as as soon as the touch function is fired off, it will do the thing. Well, the touch function is being fired off because anything in my scene is touching that block. So another item here is touching the block, therefore it is being fired off. Don't mean to make this a long one, but I do want to explain for our very, very, very beginner, beginner folks. So again, I will move this back over to where it's not actually touching another part. I believe the, the base plate here apparently doesn't count because it is... It is somewhat inside of that base plate. Yep, it's actually sticking out the bottom there. Yeah, see a piece of it. So it actually is inside the base plate and it is touching the base plate. But um, I guess that's not being counted. If that's still happening for you, I would then raise it above the base plate a little bit as well. And you can see it's not touching anything for right now. This code will do for right now. Very small, very short. But you can create things that are called condition, conditional statements using if this, then that to check to make sure that the item that's touching this is indeed a player or a humanoid and then proceed to call in the function to make in the floating box um, fall down by enabling the anchor. Guys, hopefully this didn't bore you too much. Hopefully it was educational to you. I'm gonna be making more Roblox videos in the very near future. And by near, I mean like tomorrow and the next days. So we're gonna be covering a bunch of different topics that I have actually have them written down right here. Boom, we're gonna be covering these 10 topics first. <laughs> um, AI, cloning, today we kinda of did some variables, we did a little bit of function, but I'm gonna be doing those separate in their own separate videos. Today's video was basically trigger. So again, if this helps, subscribe so you'll be notified when the other things drop. I thank you again for your patience. Have a good day, bye-bye.